everyone, this is Jennifer Beamer, owner and operator of Extra Diet Art by Science, and in today's tutorial I'm going to show you how to make supported spindle spun yarn. Before we got into the main part of the video, I wanted to take a moment to thank you personally for being here watching this video, and if you're a returning subscriber, big thumbs up to you for sticking around. And if you're new here and this is your first video, thank you for being here and consider subscribing and liking this video. Furthermore, if you want to support me and the work that I do, I have actuallydie.com and the equivalent on Etsy, and I've actually just launched a Patreon, so if you want to support me on a regular basis, consider checking that out as well. Recently, you may have seen some pictures on Instagram or Pinterest or even on Etsy where there are these supported spindles and you've probably wondered, hmm, is there a tutorial on this? There are tutorials and it has been a long time since I promised I would start doing tutorials for this type of spinning and I'm actually now sitting down to do it. Supported spindling has had some kind of revival lately with a lot of reenactors posting on YouTube how they are doing it. As well, in academia, there have been a lot of early medieval researchers who are studying textile production and some researchers who have been looking more at text and art to understand more about textile production during these periods. So I think this video is going to have this in between some historical aspects and some modern aspects so that you get a sense of how to adapt this tutorial for whatever pursuits you might have. This video is specifically designed for beginner spinners and those spinners who are interested in switching from suspended spindling or drop spindling and wanting to go into supported spindling. For those of you who are beginners and you want to have more content on how to make yarn as well, I will link to some other of my tutorial videos specifically on drop spindling so that you can take a look at those as well. As I've said in the beginning, this video is going to give you some options. So if you wanted to take on the more historical aspects of supported spindling, you will be able to take that uh, thread, so to speak, and run with it in that direction. Um, even if you're just a hobbyist, you just kind of want to explore what things were kind of like back then, but not really wanting to be historically appropriate, then this video will um, kind of help you set that that thread up. However, if you like looking at bats, and like me, I love working with bats, you can still use them for spinning of this kind. And so I feel like this kind of gets you more into that modern thread where you're still using a tool that is um, capable of spinning more historically um, appropriate type yarns, but also you can have that modern application. So it's kind of like how a spinning wheel, you can make whatever yarn you want, including some really fabulous art yarns. So it's not necessarily an ancient tool. And so I want to break down any barriers there, that there might be when thinking about this particular tool and the way that you spin with it. So that's why I wanted to include a bat. Now, in this tutorial, I'm showing you with just plain white wool or undyed wool, I guess. So I'm going to be doing other videos in the future, um, but I wanted to give you something where you're not necessarily distracted by the colors that I'm using, but focusing more on the technique. Now with that discussion out of the way, for this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to use a supported spindle with both a rolag and a bat. The second thing you're going to need to make this whole spinning process happen is the actual spindle. So I've got this one here. This is my supported spindle that um, I only have one of so far. <laughs> I'm hoping to increase my fleet, so to speak. And this is pretty much it. This is a modern style um, supported spindle, but you can use it for 
making historically appropriate type yarns. It's just if you took this to a reenactment, it wouldn't quite fit with a time period because I don't I don't know if these spindles are really all that accurate and especially considering this one has a ball bearing at the bottom. So um, if you're just wanting something that's pretty and for you, which is basically why I bought this in the first place, then it's totally fine. Um, and the next tool that you're going to need, if you want, because you can certainly use this on a table or on your leg, is a spinning bowl. I'm often seated at the couch, and so I don't want to be leaning over a table all the time. So I got this because I wanted to have a more frictionless surface so that I can spin this more quickly. Having a tool like this is really important for me. So I think these two are really the minimum investment, although you could very much just do this with the supported spindle. Now that we've talked about the tools and the fiber prep, we need to talk a little bit about twist. The way that twist enters the fiber supply for supported spindling is a little different, mainly because you have one hand operating the tool and the other hand is drafting the wool. And so you have to manage the twist in your fiber supply. So if we don't have any twist and we draft this, then the wool will just come apart. What we want to do is make yarn. So in order for that to happen, I use my left hand for the twisting with the tool and I use my right hand for the drafting of the wool. And so by spinning in a Z direction or a clockwise direction, I add some twist to form tension and then I draft against that twist. And as it starts to pull away, I add more twist with the tool and then I continue drafting with my other hand. This is how this tool works. Now, there are some caveats, which I won't get into in this video, but this method of stepping the twisting of the tool and then the drafting of the wool staggered will help you understand how to use this tool to make this kind of yarn. So after you have spun a length of yarn, you have to put it onto the spindle. If you've already been using a suspended spindle, you probably already know how to wind on the yarn so you make a stable cop. However, if this is your first video and you want to get into spinning with a supported spindle, I will also show you two ways to wind on the yarn to uh, make a stable cop for this particular spindle. The last thing I'll say is because this is a supported spindle, it's really difficult to determine when it's full. <laughs> so when I first started, I only worked in this midsection here because that's what I was familiar with when I started using this tool after being a suspended spindler for a long time. But then I also learned that I could go down onto this whirl here so I started doing that, and then I also realized that there's actually quite a lot of space here, and because it's being supported by the bowl, I don't have to worry about the tensile strength of my fiber, and so I can just basically make it as large as I want, <laughs> which is always nice when you're trying to make really big skeins. The last thing I wanted to mention about the twist in a supported spun yarn is you can actually err on the side of less twist. You can have a much lower twist yarn with this method, mainly because you don't have to rely on the tensile strength of your wool or whatever material you're working with or the twist to keep that yarn together. So what do I mean by this? If you look at how fluffy and light this yarn is, there's actually very, very small amount of twist in this yarn, but it's still holding together. And when I apply this, I'm actually going to get a very fluffy two ply. So what this method allows you to do is you can under twist a little bit. And then if you wanted to, you can over ply. So you could produce a different type of yarn that looks more like a single 
but has the strength and durability of a two ply. And so for those of you who don't like the look of a two ply, this might be a really great way of achieving that goal. But also some wools, I think, respond better to this way of spinning than others. Um, in particular, more of those primitive breeds that have those mixed coats. So you have the really soft undercoat and then sort of like that hairy outer coat. And I'll show you what those samples look like later on in this video. But supported spindling allows you to play a little bit with the twist and how the final yarn looks. Depend and then based on that, you can apply it to whatever project you select for it. So I think in this later section, I'll be able to go more in depth about how I think supported spindle spun yarns will work. And I hope that it gives you some ideas as well. The first thing you're going to need is a spindle that will rotate very nicely on a table. The second tool, which is optional, is having a spinning bowl like I have here. This one is a wooden spinning bowl with a leather strap bound to it with little feet to kind of help stabilize it on a surface and so that it doesn't scratch anything. This first spinning demonstration is going to be using a Rolag as the spinning prep method. In these videos, I am using Shetland that has been hand carded and then put into Rolex. Each one weighs about two grams, and you can see it there in the lower right hand corner of the screen. It's actually a very, very beautiful wool, as you can see in this demonstration where some of the bits of the color are coming through so it's not just plain white. And then I'm winding on the bit of yarn that I've just spun. This is a top-down view. As you can see, this particular spindle has a Swarovski crystal at the crown, but you can get some that have just a basic point. And so what's happening here is because I'm holding the wool and applying the twist with my left hand, that twist is accumulating in the yarn that I'm making. And then when I draft out from the roll leg, that twist is going into that freshly released wool from the roll leg. And so I can distribute that twist throughout the length of the yarn. And then I'm winding it back on for the next amount of yarn that I'm going to spin. This shot shows you where the point of the spindle sits in the spinning bowl. It also shows you a little bit about how stepped the spinning process is with this tool. So I add twist and I draft out and then I add more twist and then I draft out. So you can see that here with this particular shot.
This shot also shows you how you can move the spindle to um, pull the twist into the yarn. So it doesn't always have to stay stationary straight up and down. You might want to move it at an angle. So here I'm demonstrating how little twist is actually in this yarn. There's enough so that it stays together, but not so much where it really kinks up on itself, so I'm maintaining that loftiness. And now that I have reached the end of one roll lag, I need to add on the next piece. And I do that simply by drafting out a tiny wispy bit from the row lag and then I will overlay them just slightly and then I add some twist and then I draft them together There's a considerable amount of twist there. And the reason why I add more twist at a join is so that I don't accidentally draft the join apart. If you want some more close-ups on how to specifically make a join, I will link you to my tutorial on making advanced joins. So now I am showing you how to spin with a bat. I'm only using white wool here, but if you had something that was more textured, you certainly could use that as well. The principle is the same. However, if you look at what my hands are doing in this sequence, I am trying to pull open the drafting zone. This is how grist is formed. So if you look at my video on yarn grist, I explain a little bit from a loose definition point of view how to achieve a specific yarn diameter. And with supported spindling, this can um, be really helpful in pulling open those fibers so that you catch just what you need to make the drafting easy. So if you work with um, this type of supported spindle, one thing that I noted with working with a bat is if I didn't spread out the fibers in the drafting zone like this, it would catch, the twist would catch all of those bits of fiber ends, and then I would get a big slubby piece, which I still do achieve occasionally uh, from time to time. But the idea is if you use your drafting hand that is spreading out those fibers into kind of like a triangular space, then you'll be able to control the gauge of your yarn while the twist is being inserted so that you don't end up with a really thick yarn or a really thin yarn when you are trying to achieve a specific gauge. This view really showcases how that twist 
is inserted. So because I'm flicking the spindle away from me, I'm accumulating twist and then pulling the draft zone away from my spindle. And that's how I'm getting the twist to go into the fiber supply. So here's the bat. I have torn off a piece and it's a little bit thick so I decided to pull it open and make it a little smaller. But even in this state it's still not quite the right gauge for my spinning so what I'm going to do is pre-draft it so that I can maintain the gauge that I've already established for this particular yarn. And all you do is simply between two hands, gently pull one hand away from the other. And you're just lightly drafting those fibers so that you, you find that it's easy to spin with it but not so far drafted that you have a bunch of small pieces. So this is sort of what you're going for is a thinned out little roving. I also found a couple of little um, second cuts in this bat, um, in this piece of the, the bat. So I am taking a moment to just get rid of it so that I don't have to worry about a bump in my yarn, but it's also a personal preference. As before, I'm just going to overlap these ends a little bit add some twist and then I'm going to allow that twist to enter in to the yarn. Add some more twist to strengthen that join area so that when I pull up against the twist I don't cause that join to draft apart completely. So this is the second wrapping method that I mentioned at the beginning. So in the first one you saw me wrapping against the entire yarn cop, but this one I am making a smaller yarn cop near the top of the spindle so that I can focus more on just spinning the yarn rather than spinning and then stopping to wind on. So this is a personal preference and once you have accumulated some yarn there and you're ready to stop and wind on, all you need to do is with a butterfly motion, pinky thumb, pinky thumb, making a cross in the middle, holding all of that yarn under tension like so. And then having one longer wind on session so that I don't interrupt the spinning as frequently as I was doing in the first part of this video. I found this wool was a little bit springier than the Shetland and I wanted to include this particular shot because it shows you how the spindle itself moves while I'm working with it. So sometimes I hold it more at an angle when I am drafting against the twist. 
So you can use both hands in conjunction, sort of pulling away from each other. So if you find that this is more comfortable for you while you're drafting, pulling apart from both hands rather than drafting apart with one arm, I know that some individuals might find this better for their shoulders. And so I wanted to showcase that it's perfectly acceptable to do this and definitely to adapt according to your body and your needs. So in this close-up, one of the things that I wanted to show was twisting against the twi drafting against the twist. In this piece, I wanted to show you drafting against the twist. So I've added some twists, and I'm gently pulling back on the fiber supply. And as I'm doing that, you can see how that yarn is forming at the drafting zone. So I add some twist and then I start pulling it away. And by spreading out those fibers more, I'm allowing the twist to grab some of the fibers, not all of them. And I'm able to get the yarn diameter I'm looking for. It's also at this stage that you can decide how much twist you want to put into your yarn. If you want to have a high twist yarn, you certainly could achieve that with this method. So after you finish drafting out the length that you feel comfortable spinning at a time, you just continue spinning the spindle to accumulate twist in the yarn. And once you're satisfied with the amount of twist, then you can put it onto the yarn cop and it locks that twist in place. So this particular spindle gives you some options. It allows you to have a lower twist yarn, but also you can still use it for higher twist yarns as well. If you see me adding twist after I've achieved the length of yarn that I want, that's basically what I'm modulating is how much twist I want in the single so that it matches what I've spun before, but also a skein of yarn that I've made um, probably about six, seven years ago.
Spinning this way is extremely meditative, and I find that once I am seated, I get into a groove and I will keep going until I realize that it's time for bed. Or sometimes I'll run out of wool to spin and then I pretty much call it the end. So here is that yarn I was describing that I made several years ago. And the yarn that I was spinning for this tutorial is meant to resemble this initial yarn. So I'm demonstrating what the ply will look like. So it's very loose, but if I add extra twist, like I've done here, it's not quite as springy, but it actually matches this initial yarn that I made pretty well. So there's going to be some thin spots and some thick spots because again, this was more of a beginner skein for me. So I'm doing my best to match this tutorial yarn that I've been making in 2022 with this one from about 2014. So if you know what a traditional two-ply looks like, it is a little bit rectangular in cross-section. Whereas this yarn, because we have spun it with just enough twist to hold it together and then overplied it, putting some extra twist into the ply, we've actually succeeded in creating a rounder two-ply. So it still has the elasticity that I'm looking for from having it be a single, but it's actually not quite as, as elastic as it, it could be because we have that second um, ply in there. And so using this in something that's a little bit more hard wearing, it will be more durable. This first sample here was made with North Ronaldsey, and I used my little zoom loom or pin loom to create this sample. You might be able to tell that it's a two ply, but it otherwise looks pretty convincing as a single. And I really love the colors. You may also see some of those hairier fiber sticking out, and that is because this is a dual coated sheep, and I can link to you my fiber talk episode where I describe it, and those are some of the guard hairs poking out. This is my knitted sample. Again, it looks very much like a single, although there are some stitches where you can see more definitively the ply. And then again, you can see the guard hairs poking out from the yarn. It has a really nice rustic look in this knitted version. Crochet is not my forte, but I did make this little sample. North Ronaldsey may not be the prettiest yarn crocheted, but I think a supported spindle spun crocheted project would be very nice.
Whenever you are making samples, always keep a little bit extra of that initial yarn so that if you want to make more in the future, you know how to spin to that specific gauge. And also it's a nice little memento of what you've made. Okay, so that pretty much closes out this tutorial. I hope that you got a lot of information from this. I tried to give you enough visual content so they can run things back and look at it again. And I tried to do it from different angles so that you got more of a you know, teacher to student point of view as well as a first person point of view so that you got a sense of what my hands were doing at the same time. So if there's still something that you need some help with, just let me know. Um, I'll try to answer stuff in the questions or, um, uh, well, I'll try to answer your questions in the comments below. But if it warrants a new video, sort of like a supplemental, I'm also happy to do that because if you've asked the question, then there's probably someone else who's asked the question. So um, please, Give me a like if you liked this video, subscribe if you haven't already. Remember, I have a Patreon, so if you like this content and you wanna support me on a more regular basis, there's that as well. And if you need some supplies, just go to expertlydyed.com. Thanks for watching, bye.